What's up everyone? For today's conversation, I'm gonna be talking to Dr. Phil Goff. He is the African-American Studies and Psychology Professor at Yale. We talk about a bunch of different things, but most importantly, Dr. Goff is a great person who cares about this work, who's extremely knowledgeable. And I'm really excited for you guys to hear what he has to say. Dr. Goff, I appreciate the time and you coming on, having this conversation with me. How are you doing today? I mean, I'm doing all right. I don't know why you appreciate my time. You're in the middle of the season. So uh, <laughs> I appreciate that you are on a screen in front of me, not dunking on any of the Sixers. So I appreciate that greatly. <laughs> no, nah, they, they, they got us the other night, but we, we, we got something for the next time we see them. That's for sure. So tell me, who is Phil Goff? <sighs> um. I'm Philadelphia born uh, and bred. I did spend some time in West Philly on a playground. I lived in Bel Air when I was a faculty member at UCLA and I had my God children's uncle Phil. So any portion of the theme song to Fresh Prince that you want to do. Mean, the, the, the synergy right there. I'm just like, I, I didn't do it. I didn't, I didn't plan it. It <laughs> just, it ended up that way. Um, so no, like I'm, I'm Philly born and bred. Um, uh, I've, I've been an academic um, and so basically a professional nerd for a long time. Um, I'm now a professor at Yale. I'm in African American studies and in psychology. Psychology is my disciplinary training, but really it's I'm a numbers nerd. And uh, about a dozen years ago, um, I started an organization with uh, my co-founder, Tracy Kazee, called the Center for Policing Equity. Um, and what we do is we work with communities inside of law enforcement to make it less racist and less deadly and then inside of communities to make law enforcement just less, to shrink the size and the scope, the footprint of law enforcement. And really the, the goal is twofold. One is to use the science that we've got to create an evidence base so we don't keep sliding back every time we make uh, forward progress. It's on other people to go two steps forward. I'm trying to prevent the two steps back, right? Mm -hmm. But the other piece is that if you think about the way we have set up law enforcement and the criminal legal system in this country more generally, it's often the case that what we do is we're set up to punish people for making choices inside of bad options that we gave them. We gave them the bad options and then we're like, yeah, you picked the wrong one, you gotta go to jail. That, how, what, how'd that sound? What kind of mess is that? And so the nonprofit arm of the work that I do is set up to make us rethink and then redo how we treat the folks who are most vulnerable in our community. And then obviously, I'm a devotee of Prince, as you see behind me. So like, that, <laughs> those are the parts of me. We got Philly, we got Justice, we got Prince. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Goff, you're, you're a very humble man, um, but you teach at Yale, you got your degrees from Harvard and Stanford, and now you're working in this space. Walk me through a little bit of one, not only your education, because to get through all of that and to be where you are is a very difficult journey, especially for someone of color. But then how do you take that education and put it into something so much more impactful in terms of policing and these, and these statistics and the psychology and really trying to understand how we reduce that footprint? I appreciate the framing. Um, I don't consider myself so much humble as I am realistic. And none of the things that I got came from me. It came from being the, the lucky person who managed to get through grace and fortune, um, uh, but you know, they have, they have words in lots of, in several Southeast Asian cultures, they got words for the good luck that comes from people who work hard. Um, uh, and I do, I get up every day and I go to sleep every night. Um, and right before I, right after I get up, right before I go to sleep, I say, ain't nobody outworking me. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, I mean, there's a grind to it as well, but I could have, I could have worked this hard. I could have been as talented as I am, as talentless as I am. Um, uh, and none of this stuff comes to me. Um, uh, yeah. So the, what it is to go through all these elite academic circles, it's a, it's a language and it's a game like anything else, right? Um, I have a lot of, of folks I went to school with, folks that are my colleagues, um, and they just learned the game. Some of them, they grew up playing it. So I don't know when you first touched ball, but like you were playing for a little while before you got to the NBA, right? So same thing, going to Harvard, there was a bunch of folks who like they had, my dad was a professor. So I learned the game a little bit early. I had other folks who were like several generations of folks who had all gone to Harvard. I was like, wow, that, that must come with some things. Um, the hard part, I think for, for black folks in particular, 
is that even if you've got a father like I did who had, who had gone through the academy and had done that thing and great grandparents, I'm like, I traced college. My mother has two master's degrees. Her mother has a master's degree. Her mother went to college and her mother was born slave. But every one of that, uh, that, of that ancestor, my great, great grandmother's children went to college. Wow. Even so you show up and college is not for setting us free. So if you thought your education was going to get you free, it's a rude awakening. I think part of the thing that is different about the journey that I've taken is that instead of saying, oh, I want to get an A, or I want to go to this grad school, or I want to get this job, that's always been secondary. Like when I went to Harvard, I was like, I want to answer questions that I'm having a hard time with. And I spent a lot of time doing that. Went to grad school, I said, I want to create a language for this thing that I, I can't express, right? And then in, in working in the criminal legal system and policing in particular and public safety side, when I started doing this, you know, I, I got out in 2004 from, um, from grad school. My, my, I got the PhD in 2005, but I got out in 2004. I was like, I need to be here because nobody else is here. There's nobody, there were, we were just starting to talk about prisons and jails. Mm -hmm. Ain't nobody talking about cops because cops are the good folks who run towards danger. And I was like, sometimes, right? But, but for the rest of it, we don't have to figure out how to have a language that recognizes the full humanity, the good things that they do in communities and all the generations of damage and trauma that they have been centrally tasked with inflicting on us. Yeah. And if you have a goal that's different than the way that the, the system is set up, there will be struggles but then you don't have the stress of wondering whether or not you're gonna achieve the way that other people expect you to. So when I got tenure, I was like, cool, all right. That was on the way to doing some other stuff, right? Um, and when I got this job, I was like, that's great. I got great friends there. They're gonna give great resources. They're gonna scaffold this work to do better, right? But it, the goal was never what I ended up getting. And that makes the journey harder, but less stressful. Mm. So talk to me about kind of the genesis for when you came up for the Center for Police Equity and where is it now and where do you see it or where do you hope it gets to? So the first place that we, the thing that happened was basically I got dared into doing it. Um, I know that you have never seen this happen before. You've been a black man your whole life, right? So you, you've never mm -hmm. seen it happen that two black people meet and they are like <laughs> assaulting each other's character instantly. Right, so Absolutely. I'm gonna tell you the origin story. I was, I was at a conference that my advisor um, had put together from grad school. So I just left and they dragged yep. me back to Stanford, right? Um, and it was on, it was called Policing Racial Bias, right? It was a real visionary thing that Jennifer Everhart put on. And there were really badly dressed nerds who were picked last for kickball. And then there were, there were folks in uniform. Um, and it was actually, it was the second one that she put together, I think it was 2007. And then there was this one woman who was just way too well-dressed to be a professor but wasn't in uniform. I was like, well, who the heck are you? And she was sitting by herself. And I felt like, oh, well, I should be welcome. I come up like, hey, would you mind if I sit with you? She looks me up and down just like this. She goes, you ain't got the balls to do anything real in life. Wow, off the rip, so, okay. I was like, oh, oh, okay. So I stuck up my head. I was like, hi, my name is Phil. It's really glad that you, I'm really glad that you could dispel all the stereotypes that all cops are jackasses. <laughs> and immediate, like immediate sibling rivalry thing going on. I've never met this woman before. Um, and so she dared me, she's like, all, psych all psychologists want to do is do stuff in their lab. They don't really want to get in the world and, and help people. I was like, well, that's cool. Cause all, all, all cops want to do is do dirt, kill folks and not get caught. And she goes, Oh, okay. I said, so if you give me the data, I'll do some real science. She goes, well, could you come out in June? I said, how about May? And then it was on because once I had access to what was actually happening in police departments, I was like, Oh no, I'm going to do this forever because these stories of the, I mean, when you see the worst of what's happening in black communities and you see people coming out through that, again, I know you've seen that. I know a bit about your life, right? Yeah. And how you have decided that the NBA is great and you decided you're going you gonna to literally dunk on folks, but that's too small for the vision of who you want to be, that's right? Amazing. You want to make sure that your legacy is about what's happening in those most vulnerable communities. You start looking at that and you see that oftentimes the only number they know to call are folks who might show up and be heroes in capes and might show up and be villains literally looking to snuff out your life. Mm. You have to start telling that story to increase the number of heroes and decrease the number of villains 
and decrease the number of times they got a call for help in the first place. And so from that 2007 conversation to now, we grew from a couple of folks that I was paying with my salary um, to uh, an organization that's uh, very nearly 100 uh, people. It's the largest organization on racism and public safety in the world. Um, and our goal, again, is to arm the genius of community with the tools they need so that they don't have to call in crisis nearly as often. And when they do, the right resources show up instead of a badge and a gun trying to be a cure for, for homelessness, substance abuse, uh, <clears throat> mental health issues, and abuse, uh, abuse in the home as if it never could be. So over the summer, there's been so much dialogue, right? Obviously, abolitionists have been working long before, more recently, you know, the term defund the police, you know, administrations have always talked about criminal justice reform. How realistic is it that we can not only reduce the footprint of the policing in our communities, but like you said, have different resources and have the appropriate people called and responding to the situations that are needed to actually prevent harm? Yeah, so I'm a, I'm a push that question in part back on you. Have you ever known anybody who's had a problem where they could have called the police and did something else? Where they Absolutely. called a friend? Mm -hmm. That's all, all the time. All mm -hmm. the time. Right, you, you may even have heard somebody say, don't you ever call the police, I don't care what happened. You might have heard <laughs> yeah. that someplace, right? Yeah. So there are, there are our households that are doing a, a smaller version of abolishing law enforcement in their day to day. Um, it's absolutely realistic that we can remove people whose job it is to purvey violence or remove freedom from the job of taking care of people's mental health. If you have someone who's considering suicide, who thought it was a good idea to introduce a badge and a gun to that situation? We could, we could remove that immediately. And we just saw Denver have has segregated mental health response from law enforcement response. And the chief is like, why did we ever do it the other way? We're saving lives. It's absolutely reasonable that we can rethink how we treat the most vulnerable folks who tend to be disproportionately the, the children, the descendants of formerly enslaved folks from this country. It's absolutely realistic. How we do it is harder. There are some great examples, like, like I said, in Denver, Oakland, they've been doing this. Kat Brooks, uh, I just had a conversation with her a little while ago. Kat Brooks talking about like, don't give San Francisco the credit for what Oakland's been doing. Right. Um, so they've been doing it in some of the uh, some of these places. That's all. That's fantastic. But how much money do we want to take out of law enforcement and put into which social services exactly? And some social services we're going to need to invest. And by the way, it takes time to hire people and get them trained up, especially if you've got to build new systems. So how long do we need to invest in them before we see the payoff that will reduce the reliance on law enforcement? Those seem like real boring questions. I specialize, and you see this right here, I specialize in the unsexy all day, every day. Um, I feel bad for my wife. <laughs> um, but, but the unsexy parts, the budget reconciliation portions, right? Like the, the uh, fiduciary obligations to previously collective bargained um, uh, 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 set-asides, that's a lot of where the work is right now. And the folks who are newly activated to this they hadn't been through a budget cycle before, or they just went through their first one. So it's going to take some time for all of us to get together on the same page and for us to get the bureaucracy out of the way. And that saps momentum. It saps a lot of energy, right? But it absolutely is possible in the same way that you could put together, um, uh, you know, a, a group of folks to play a game that nobody had ever thought of before. And then it becomes an institution because it's household names. That becomes a brand in and of itself. Just because we've never done it before doesn't mean it's possible. It just means it's going to take people imagining that it is. Absolutely. Absolutely. And one thing I wanted to ask you too, you know, because, you know, you are a psychologist, a lot of, you know, we hear these statistics, right? But it's about police brutality, but it's about policing all of these different things. And, you know, sometimes you have conversations with people that say, look, I understand those statistics, but this is what happened to my family, or this is what happened to a close friend, or this is what, you know, our community is dealing with. So I, I get all those numbers, but what about my experience? What is your, th or what are your thoughts of the conversation around healing and trauma associated with these things and the, the psychology of 
not only seeing these things in the media, whether it's the videos um, that are shared on social media or things like that, but how do we heal these statistics on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah, I mean, I, th I feel like the question you're asking is a real hard question to answer. Um, it so is, and I don't, I, don't, I don't expect you guys to have an answer, but just more, more, more of an educated research <laughs> opinion than, than just- No, it's okay, it's okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna come for you next, let's go. We're gonna, we gonna talk about that job <laughs> in the third quarter. Uh, <laughs> um, I think it's a, it's a hard question to answer because it happens on so many levels. You know, um, I, I have to tell my students this all the time. I'm a social scientist, right? My job is to do science in the social world. But social science is a purveyor of violence too. Exactly the way that you said, it's like, I'll tell you, if somebody come to me and be like, the cops beat up my brother and he never walked right after that. And I'd be like, well, you know, beatings that end up in long-term maimings are only 0.2% uh, of all contact with law enforcement. And it's as if what I'm trying to say is that didn't happen or it doesn't matter. That's some violent mess to do. By the way, I would never say that. <laughs> and people who do say yeah, that should yeah. get checked, right? Um, sure. But social science does violence by pretending that the individual experience is somehow less important than the aggregated experience. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about healing, there's individual folks who just got to heal, right? Like, I, like I, I've had the good fortune to be able to meet, but also bad fortune because this happened in their lives. Folks who have survived this personally, um, who are family members of folks who didn't survive contact with law enforcement. And that journey has to be individual. So today it was just announced, I think it was just today, um, the family of Alton Sterling um, is being given $4.5 million in a settlement for the police killing of Alton Sterling in, in Baton Rouge. They had previously been offered $5 million. And they said, we really want more justice in the department. They didn't get any justice for the department, but they got less money for one injustice. So it's a slap in the face also that there's any dollar amount that could replace a life. But now they got to deal with, we tried for justice and we got no justice and less. How'd that sound? I don't know how they're going to heal beyond with their community day by day, hopefully with therapy and the help of mental health professionals, right? Like they, they heal spiritually together, but that's a different question than how do we heal as a nation from all the violence from law enforcement. And there I'd say, I don't think it's time for healing yet. And I'm not trying to get people to, to move towards violence. I'm just trying to say, to heal, you have to go back to something that was okay. Sometimes for a, a leg to heal right, you gotta break it and set it. And law enforcement in this country, in too many cities started when there were runaway slaves. And in the places where that's not where it started, they still had racist laws on the books and it was law enforcement's job to enforce racist laws. And we at no point in time in this country's history said, you know what, that thing we put together to do that racist stuff, that's jacked up, we should stop doing that. We never had a clean break. Mm -hmm. I think we need a kind of clean break. Of, of That's why we're talking about reimagining in the context of abolition. Mm -hmm. The reimagination is about, well, how would we want to treat folks who were given terrible options and had to make some kind of choice. And the folks in that community, they don't want more punishment, even if they were the, the survivors of violence. They want to invest in jobs and education and opportunity, even for the folks who victimized them. Mm. So I don't want to heal before we've decided what a healthy body would look like. Because if you heal and the toxins are still sealed up inside, you're just going to have to, like I said, break that bone and do it all over again. Um, so the individual healing is a different thing than the, the, the collective healing. And I don't think it's time for that collective healing just yet. Man, that, that, that's a deep answer. And like I said, I, I, you, you, had, you had a much better answer than I, uh, than I would have had on that. <laughs> so let's see, that's why I asked it. Um, my last question here, because I know we're pushing up against time and obviously I'll give you a, a chance to ask any questions that you have, but you know, what future or hope do you see for police transformation? I'm so glad that you said transformation um, so that because because you, you frame this as this is not just reform. We talk about abolition. Right. And I, I'm so glad that you said transformation. Um, I think for public safety, we got to really have again, I'm a nerd, so I'm going to talk numbers. We don't need to have the numbers first. But if you if you were to define what public safety means, I think I think you might have a hard time because I got a hard time with it. And then if I said, no, how are you going to measure that? I, I, I think we, we'd be at the blackboard for a long time, both of us. 
Yeah. So if we don't have a metric for what we mean by public safety, how are we supposed to hold folks accountable to it? Right. I, I know you know what your numbers are on the season. I know that you do. <laughs> and I know you know the places where you would like them to be better. So what are you doing in the gym every damn day? You working on the things that you're trying to get better. Yeah. Right. If you didn't have the numbers, it'd be a lot harder. Right. You wouldn't know what to work on. You wouldn't know how to make it better. We haven't defined public safety outside of crime. And we've defined crime as basically just stuff that black people do that we don't like. Again, how does that sound? <laughs> we got to first define what safety is and then put in place the institutions that can, that can put it together. No community feels like police are going to make them safe, except for the communities that were already safe and need to be protected from their idea of other communities. Mm -hmm. So the future of public safety, I really hope, is that we're defining public safety in the language that makes sense for the folks who aren't safe, and that we're giving those folks the things that they need, which will never be police first. It will never be police first. It will always be the power to keep themselves and their loved ones safe. That's, that's what I'm hoping for going forward. Dr. Gomp, that was that was a sermon right there. We, yeah, yeah, we got to get that out there. Get that I'll out leave there. a little bit of work now. Now you said you were going to give me a little bit of time. Yeah, I gotta absolutely. Ask. I gotta ask. Absolutely. So yeah. this summer, right? There was all like the the season was all kind of jacked up, right? We I don't even want to talk about how my team was doing the last season, right? Like, like it just yeah. it's erased from my mind. Um, sure. But this summer, you're in the process. You have a job. Right. And your job involves incredible dedication and focus on you and your body and your teammates. And I've heard athletes talk about when it's time to perform. I don't want to be thinking about anything outside of. Mm. And yet you have performed well. Right. Your numbers did well. Mm. And your focus so far outside. Of that. How do you manage to balance between a job that requires so much dedication and focus and a world where you know you can have a big impact because of how well you've done at that job. How were you doing that this summer when the country was on fire? Well, I think it goes back to one, the precedent set by players long before me, right? Players who have taken a stand, who have made it so that sports isn't in the conversation, right or wrong. Sports is always going to be in the conversation of whatever's going on culturally, whatever going on um, from an activism standpoint, whatever is going on from um, a platform microphone that can boost awareness to anything, right? It happens in endorsements and it can happen on social justice issues, right? They're, they go hand in hand, the microphone doesn't discriminate. So mm -hmm. to be able to say, look, you know, it's getting towards the end of the season, it's getting towards time to lock in, even coming into this year, you know, unusual season with COVID and things like that, that doesn't stop you from walking out of the arena and being a black man. From walking out of the arena and saying that the issues that plagued my community were the same when I entered that building and are gonna be the same when I walk out. Like I am no different than anybody else driving my car down the road, whether I'm wearing a suit, whether I'm wearing my team jumpsuit or whether I'm just wearing, you know, a t-shirt and shorts. Like we all face these same issues. So if I'm not going to use this microphone and this platform to speak on these issues and say, look, myself, my teammates, other people in this league are not absolved from any of these same issues that you're seeing over here. Like your favorite sports player faces the same issues that Sandra Bland faced, mm -hmm. that Alton Sterling faced, that anybody else has faced, George Floyd. So to be able to speak on these issues is, in my opinion, um, it's an opportunity to really make sure these issues and these topics stay on the front page. Because there's, there's a lot of entities and a lot of people that don't even want it in the paper, don't even want it on the back page. They just, they, just, they just want that conversation completely to the side. They want to enjoy sports in a very bland form. You go out and perform, you say the right things about the team or you say the right things about the game. Maybe there's a little drama in terms of team to team, but there's nothing else associated with real life in, in the basketball. Yeah, and, and so as I was watching athletes stand up and take a stand on these issues, I was wondering how much you felt like the NBA was helping with that. Um, and I'm not trying to get you into tr any trouble on this, but here's what I mean. Yeah. Um, we all saw what happened in the NFL 
when some folks decided to take a stand by taking a knee. Um, and, uh, you know, I deal with folks in communities every day where at the end of whatever we're talking about, we're like, yeah, yeah, we should ban the chokehold. And you know what they need to do is they need to get cat back his job. I hear that regularly. Yeah. Um, and it just seemed like in the WNBA, even more so even than in the NBA, but in the NBA as well, there was, there were, was more freedom. It seemed like the, the athletes felt like there was more freedom to come and speak their mind. I wonder if you could speak to whether or not that feels like the case, and even more controversially, if I can get you in a little trouble, if you can see what it, what, if you could talk about what it's like watching other athletes in other uh, uh, other sports and watching them struggle and balance on that. I think first of all, it's important to acknowledge that the WNBA has been consistent in their activism from the jump. Like there, there was, there's never been any any discussion or ever. Any, ever any wondering about where they where they stand on issues like mm -hmm. they are always front and center they're always out there the attention they might not get the the headline treatment but they've been consistent all the way through so I don't want to let you know the actions that you know we did as a league in the bubble overshadow the years of work that they put in but about the NBA I think that they did they did step up they did allow players to really use the platform and support in that process in terms of saying, look, this is what's going on in our community. You know, we are hurting, we are angry, we are tired, and we're gonna voice this opinion, not only in our interviews, but on the court with our jerseys and, you know, whatever medium that we're using, we're gonna speak on that. And they said, okay, you know, we're also going to amplify those messages and stand in solidarity with you. And other players and other leagues don't necessarily have that same alignment, especially in that moment in time when there was there was a shift happening, there was a different conversation happening than your usual um, voicing of issues. Like this, this there's, there was a monumental shift. There's a pandemic. There's you know racial injustice. There's finally people you know collectively across the country hitting the streets and saying enough is enough. So when you see other athletes who are struggling saying. Look, I want to speak out. I want to support, but whether it's the team owner came out and said, you know, look, you know, my players aren't going to do this or the league is not supporting you or, you know, you're the only black athlete in your sport, you know, Bubba Wall is stepping out and saying, look, this is how I feel. And there, there might not be anybody in the stands or, you know, who I'm competing against who may understand, but this is what I'm going to do. And obviously we saw you know, the reaction there. So, you know, I think it's, um, it was great to see that, but the work has to continue. You know, at that point in time, everything was aligned and it was great, but, you know, it's a new season. There are different things going on. You know, we're, we're in a different time and for players to continue to, you know, keep their foot on the gas, to continue to educate themselves, have conversations, continue to link up with people who are doing the work and or contribute financially with your time, with your voice, all of these different types of things. Like the alignment may not be always the same, but it's still on the players and the athletes to continue to, to try to do our part. Yeah. And I, I look at the folks who are, are standing up against a league. And I'm like, I wonder how the league gets to brand that way. Right. It, especially given this summer, folks took to the street and they made things possible that weren't possible before. You know, the idea of police abolition isn't new, um, but the public's uh, understanding of it and the fact that it's reaching our ears absolutely is new. Right. Um, like defunding law enforcement. Like we've been doing that for years, taking small amounts from law enforcement budgets and putting it into social services with the help of law enforcement. Right. Like it wasn't even a controversial task. Like been doing that for years. And then all of a sudden it becomes. Um, so this summer made a lot of things possible that weren't possible otherwise. And it, I think it obviously woke up a bunch of folks to how much work was to be done. But you've been doing, it turns out you've been doing this work since before this summer. You've been caring about these issues since before this summer. And so I'm not sure what we got in terms of time, but if I got time for one more question, my last for question sure. to you is, um, you know, the cameras are going to turn away. Like we have, uh, sanity has returned to some small, in some small degree to D.C., uh, you don't have to say that. I get to say that. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, the fires have died down. Um, there is movement, even though it's slow and it's starting to get more unsexy, which is it's my wheelhouse. Um, 
But what that means is that we're, we're starting slowly with the vaccine and the rest, hopefully to get back to something closer to normal. Mm-hmm. How do you think about either keeping people involved or getting people involved when it's no longer the same headline, when it's not on the front page? How do you think about helping people not look away um, uh, while we're moving away from this being the only thing on TV? You know, it was, it was so interesting. I had the, the best picture laid out for me um, before the election of, of exactly what you're talking about. I was on a Zoom and Stacey Abrams was talking and she was talking about all of the years it took to build the infrastructure mm-hmm. in Georgia that allowed Georgia to vote away the way it did in the election, right? And then she would go on to talk about all of the work that would continue to have to happen in order for legislation because everyone, you know, when something happens in our community, we hit the streets. When it's time to, you know, vote in elections, you know, we get out all these, get out in the vote campaign. But then for the actual change, for the actual legislation, for all these other things, the non-sexy work, that is where the change happens. And that's where a lot of times you get stuck. And, you know, for me, you know, I, I've, I've seen this kind of go around a few times where the cameras show up and it's, you know, it's February, it's Black History Month and, you know, everyone wants to do a story and people want to talk about all these things, support Black businesses, you know, in vogue right now, right? Everyone wants to talk about it, but Black businesses have been around for a very long time. Like, and they will continue to be around even when, you know, that's not, you know, on the bumper sticker of people's cars. So, you know, how do you continue to dig into big problems you know, connect with, you know, people like yourself, people who, you know, are, are, are highly educated, doing the work, you know, well-connected and say, look, how can we continue to, to build on these things to have this infrastructure so that when the next moment comes around, it's, oh, okay, look, we, we, it's just simply, this is what we need. This is where we're at. You know, this is where this new influx of energy and enthusiasm and excitement can be plugged in to help continue this process that has been rolling along slowly. So, you know, I understand the challenges that are ahead and all the work that needs to be done. But for me, that's that's the exciting part is saying for hundreds of years, all of these people have put in this work. Let me add my energy to hopefully, you know, carry carry the baton a little bit more and then the next generation will will take it from there. You know, when you say that, it reminds me, Kwame Ture has this wonderful, he, he, he's done, he did a bunch of different times. He has this wonderful... Um, speech or, or answer to a question on a panel where he's talking about the difference between mobilizing and organizing. Mm. Mobilizing is taken to the streets. And on one level, mobilizing is easy, but also your opponents will mobilize against you. Organizing, that's the long game. Um, and one of the things I appreciate about um, what I know of your, your community engagement um, <clears throat> and, and your voice on these issues is that you're always calling out other folks who are organizing, not just mobilizing. Mobilizing is important, but organizing, having a strategy uh, for something, that's that's how stuff gets changed and that's how, how that change becomes lasting. So I appreciate that. Absolutely, man. We, you know, I've, I've learned not only in team sports, but you know, just in this work that we all, we all have a role to play. Some are, some are in, the, in the spotlight in front of the microphone all the time. Others are in the background, others are literally keeping everything going with no, you know, public acknowledgement whatsoever. But for each of us to do our jobs well, that's what's gonna, that's what's gonna make the lasting change. So Dr. Goff, you are excelling, excelling in your role. You're doing the, you're doing the work, man. I just wanna not only thank you for this conversation, but thank you for, you know, all the things that you're doing. And, you know, I definitely look forward to, you know, staying connected and continue to tap in with your work. No, I mean, I appreciate it. Thank you for the time, especially mid-season. Here is to uh, an ongoing collaboration between the folks who can do the sexy work and the unsexy work. (laughs) Absolutely, man. Thank you for the time.